first of all, let me say uh, good morning, Dr. Williams. How are you? Good morning. I'm great. How are you? I'm doing fine. It's uh, been a long time. I don't think we have talked since the um, coronavirus uh, took place back in March. We have not. We have not. Other than in, in uh, I've, I've seen you um, talking a lot, but not about <laughs> uh, uh, schools so much. <laughs> no, so, much. so how much of an adjustment has it been for you uh, since March to make the, because I guess you guys, you were in school when everything hit. And then what did you have to do? Go out, you had to come out of school and stop and then plan for the next year. Describe for us what that was like. Yeah, it was, it was, um, it was a very interesting time because we did not have time to plan. On March 13th, the governor had a press conference and she did announce that the following week that schools would close and would remain closed for, um, I think at that time there was a, 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 a specific date, um, but then it was extended to be closed for the remainder of the school year. And um, one thing that's different now as opposed to then is that we did not have time to come up with a definitive plan as to what remote learning would look like and how we would move forward. Um, so we did galvanize our team and uh, we used learning packets, uh, which was you know, paper packets, and made sure that all of our scholars um, did have access to those paper packets and just uh, developed a, a protocol for dropping them off and picking them up, uh, make sure that we provided meals for all of our scholars, including using our parent university bus to deliver meals throughout the community. Uh, and just really try to, as much as possible, stay connected. One of the first things that we did was establish a, a strategic plan just to get us through that initial space. And our first goal of that plan was to stay connected. And uh, Courtney Washington, our community engagement specialist, did an amazing job of using our social media outlet to provide information, to uh, have celebrations, even to provide contests um, and uh, a virtual spirit week, just to make sure that we were able to stay connected with our scholars and our families. So it was, it was very challenging because of the, the lack of time to prepare, but it was also great to see the creativity uh, from our teachers, leaders, and staff as they embarked in that, that challenge. How have the students reacted to this new uh, way of learning? How are they, how are they reacting and responding to, to scholars? Well, it's, it's you know, it, you know, for our scholars, it does vary because, you know, you've got some who um, have computers at home and are used to doing work on computers on a regular basis. And then we've got, you know, some of our scholars did not have devices or even connectivity at home. And so there are absolutely going to be some challenges to make sure that we uh, meet everybody's needs. Um, now, we did have a summer program that was completely virtual, which gave us an opportunity to troubleshoot. We had some amazing feedback from our scholars who participated in that. So I do feel optimistic uh, that we'll be able to move forward and engage uh, all of our scholars. But I also do know that for um, our young people who did not have computers and did not have connectivity until this point, uh, that we will have to work to make sure that they are supported. Um, and we're going to make sure that we're working with our teachers so that they understand how to, to deliver small group instruction and how to provide intervention and necessary supports for any of our scholars who are struggling. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that uh, I guess this past graduation was the was that the first drive through graduation that, that you know of it happened well it was, it was our first um, there, there were other people of you know across the nation you saw a lot of creative ways to um make sure that our seniors were celebrated um and so we i did see several others who did drive through um and, and drop in graduation so there were a lot of different models out there uh, and it wasn't it wasn't as ideal as we would have liked of course we would have loved to be able to celebrate our uh graduating scholars in a more traditional way, but safety and health um, had to prevail as our priorities. And so I do think it was a, a great celebration. They still were able to walk across the stage. Uh, we provided a photographer and provided free uh, eight by 10 pictures or five by seven, I think, pictures uh, for every single graduating scholar. Um, and also had the yard signs that were beautiful, um, that will be a keepsake forever because this was a senior year like no other for them. So there's a lot of memorable things happened during this year for sure. And, um, you know, and I do think that their graduation and the activities that we did to try to make it as, as normal and traditional as possible, they'll remember that for years to come. 
Now, I understand that there's some issues um, that have to be considered as you um, look at the possibility of uh, virtual um, uh, versus going back to the traditional setting. Uh, and I think what I heard was one of the problems was that if you have 800 students changing classes and in the hallways, that that would be an issue in terms of social distancing. And I believe I was told that, they, that one of the solutions was that instead of the um, students going from class to class, the teachers would go from class to class. Have you had a dialogue about that? On, and do you have any thoughts on what you should do if you have to return to a traditional setting? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we thought about that and how that would look um, across our grade spans. You know, elementary, that would not be hard to do. Um, even at School of Discovery, we could probably manage it. Um, but when you get to middle and high school, it's, it's not um, typical that if, if I'm a student that I have all of my classes with the same students, um, you know, with my same peers. So it, that, that becomes a little bit more challenging at our secondary level, I'm sorry. Um, and we would have to look at it differently for the secondary level. Um, but you know, one thing that we will continue to offer is the virtual learning. And so ideally we'll have fewer uh, scholars uh, who are, are in school for face-to-face -face learning because of that. Um, and then we've also even considered uh, for face-to-face -face learning if we had um, still a hybrid model where um, you may only come to school on Mondays and Wednesdays and your peers are there on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So, you know, we, we're going to have to look at it in a very creative way. Um, we already have several ideas in place um, or that we will be ready to put in place um, during the second quarter of our school year. Uh, but it will all depend on what the data say in terms of where our numbers are and what the community spread is like um, within Selma and Dallas County. Now, I know the governor of, uh, has donated, uh, has set aside millions of dollars uh, to help buy equipment and to help assist uh, the various school systems with this crisis uh, that you're in. <clears throat> Excuse me, how, where are we at uh, in terms of uh, students having access to all the, the, the um, uh, digital tools and, and distance learning tools that they need in Selma? Where are we here? Yeah, we're, we're almost there. Uh, we have enough devices to ensure that our scholars in grades three through 12 get them this week. And then we've got um, several hundred others that are on the way. Um, and so for our younger scholars, they will get their devices as soon as they come in. And so we are beginning with learning packets for our um, pre-K through second grade scholars this year. And, um, and again, they will get their devices when they come in. And one of the other programs, the that the governor is promoting is the Alabama Broadband um, and Connectivity Program, um, ABC. And it's going to provide free internet for any family that qualifies for free or reduced lunch. Mm -hmm. And all of our families should be getting a letter next week that will include a voucher where they will take that voucher to the internet providers within our community and they will come and they will set it up. They will provide the equipment and the service will be free until December 30th. Um, and so we're looking forward to being able to um, help support our parents to ensure that they take advantage of that. Uh, we do have a number of uh, MIFI hotspots that we've also ordered um, that will be beneficial for our, our families. And uh, we may even do some bus hotspots in communities if the need arises for us to do that as well. Um, but we are um, prepared to support our scholars in terms of making sure that we are closing that digital divide and ensuring that connectivity is not a, a challenge either. I mentioned our strategic plan for COVID-19 and um, our, our uh, second goal was to um, make sure that we uh, address the digital divide, divide, actually to eliminate the digital divide to ensure that um, all of our scholars had the access and the connectivity to be able to engage in remote learning. Well, you had already started, as I understand, planning before the COVID-19 pandemic hit. For a last mm -hmm. a year or two ago, you had already um, uh, been developing some plans to, to eliminate that divide anyway, hadn't you? We had, and at R.B. Hudson, uh, we were already one-to-one -one 
um, uh, and the high school was ready to move in that direction. And all of our elementary schools had, had ordered a certain number of devices. We weren't necessarily one-to-one -one or sending them home with our scholars, um, but certainly uh, with the um, amount of STEM and STEAM activities that we have in all of our schools, uh, we did uh, order more and provide more devices in the last uh, two years than what we've done in the past. So really, you're really ahead of the game then. You, in some ways, you were ahead of, of, uh, uh, um, of this whole COVID-19 uh, scenario. That's a great way to look at it. <laughs> yeah, it's cool. I'll, I'll take that. You know, we, we, you know, it's it's th it's one thing to have the devices, but um, you know, to to really have a plan to have effective virtual learning, um, it that that takes time. And one thing that I'm really excited about is that our board did approve a new calendar for our school year, which allowed us to push our start date from the 10th to the 24th for our scholars, but keep it as August 5th for our teachers. And so our teachers have been in school since August 5th, um, getting professional development so that they can learn all about our online platforms, all about the learning management system and the other resources and tools that they'll have access to for virtual learning. Um, and, and that was something that's, that's gonna be really necessary to ensure that they are prepared and supported to be successful as instructors through uh, virtual learning. So what about extracurricular activities and what about truancy? How do you, how do you guarantee that students are, are going to um, do their homework and, and, and uh, what kind of extracurricular activities have been approved and how do you do that safely? So uh, we are uh, having some fall, uh, fall sports this year. We are um, not doing middle school fall sports this year. And many of our middle school uh, scholar athletes will play for the high school for football and for volleyball. Um, and to do it safely, we will go above and beyond the Alabama High School Athletic Association's guidelines. They actually have a very uh, detailed guidebook, but we're going to take it even a step further. When uh, we open our season for our home football games, we're going to play with no spectators. Um, and you know, we're going to make sure that our, our players and our, our coaches, our band, and any other uh, people who are participating in our athlete, athletics um, are following the social distancing guidelines, are going above and beyond with the cleaning routines and the sanita sanitation routines um, that we ha already have in place. And just making sure they have all the supplies that they need so that they are able to do that. So will you be videotaping the games or or how would that work? We, we, we are um, looking at a way to make sure that we can stream the games, video mm -hmm. them and stream them mm -hmm. um, so that, you know, if, if players um, are, you know, on the, on the scholarships uh, track, they would still be able to have footage of themselves playing. So yes, we will absolutely have a way to make sure that families can watch it, even if it's not um, at the game in person, they'll still be able to watch it because of the streaming uh, program that we'll use. Okay, all right, and as we start winding down, um, give us the schedule. What's what's going to happen? Where are we at? And your and how you're interacting with the governor and the state board of education and in your planning, uh, strategic plan. Give us the rundown of what we can expect between now and the end of the uh, end of this year. Actually, December. Okay. Sure, sure. So um, again, our scholars start on um, Monday, which is August 24th. Um, the current governor's order ends at the end of this month. And so right now there's um, a mandate for masks, uh, even at the, um, the school level. Um, and so we are, of course, following those guidelines and then waiting to see what her next um, um, order may consist of. Um, I do know that the community spread is decreasing in many communities and which lets us know that the things that we're doing um, are working. You know, we need to stay the course with wearing our masks and, uh, and social distancing. Um, as far as school, we will begin to revisit uh, whether or not we'll have face-to-face -face learning for our second quarter uh, about midway through um, this first quarter. So really in about three weeks, we'll start to uh, revisit and looking at the data, looking at the numbers, looking at the number of cases that we've had within our school system as well as within the community. And um, uh, at least uh, two weeks before uh, the end of the quarter, we will make a decision and um, look at the possibility of beginning some face-to-face -face learning. So phase two of our plan does start um, around October uh, 7th, 
And at that point, that's where we're looking at uh, the possibility of bringing some scholars back for face-to-face -face learning. We, uh, the expectation for that will be that we will phase in the face-to-face -face learning that we do. Phase three of our plan begins in January when we return to school after uh, the Christmas holidays. Um, and at that point, uh, we'll be looking at, are we ready for traditional learning again? Um, so everything will be data driven. Uh, so there are some things that we don't know and won't know until we get closer to that time. Um, but one thing that will be consistent is the communication. We will make sure that we continue to have our chat and chew sessions. Uh, we uh, had, had a number of chat and chew sessions um, over the course of this entire uh, pandemic time frame. And one of our um, most recent ones, uh, parents said that they wanted to continue it during the school year. And so we'll be pushing out a schedule for those um, at the start of the week next week. And also just making sure that, that parents have a way to get their questions answered and avenues to access any of the supports that they may need to ensure that their, their scholars are being successful. So communication will be the name of the game as we move forward. And uh, Courtney has done an amazing job of making sure that our communication is robust it's timely and it's in various places um, so that we can reach our, our families um, during the course of, of the uncertainty that's, that's ahead of us. Because like I said, there are things that we don't know right now and we won't know until we get closer to the date and really making sure that we're looking at the data and making those data-driven decisions as to how we move forward. Uh, but what I can, can say for sure though is that we are committed to making sure that we return to excellence and that we do so in a safe and healthy manner, but also that we're doing it as we provide high quality instruction, as well as social emotional learning and wraparound services for our families. What about our scholars that qualify for lunch and breakfast programs? Is there a way to continue to give them food? Absolutely. We, we um, actually communicated our, our uh, plan, the times and the locations for meals, um, I think you know, yesterday, Courtney, and, um, and so we will make sure that families know that, that lunch and breakfast will still be provided on a daily basis. Um, Monday through Thursday will be for pickup, and on that Thursday pickup, they'll also receive um, a meals for Friday. Mm -hmm. What about your teachers? How are they handling things emotionally? Are they making the adjustment, uh, you know, in this fearful environment? Mm -hmm. Overall, I would say yes, but it's hard, you know, because, you know, families, um, you know, it's real because, you know, we've got many of our, our families have been impacted directly by COVID-19. Um, and so, you know, we are making sure that we stay uh, communicating uh, closely with and supporting our teachers as well. One of the things that we're looking at is shifting how our community partners support Whereas um, in the past, most of the supports were aimed at our scholars. We are asking that our community partners adopt a faculty, you know, look at um, how you can support our teachers and staff at schools, you know, give them a nice note, let them know that they're valued, give them some words of encouragement um, and just be, be uh, a part of our team in lifting up our teachers because this is, has been and will continue to be stressful and, you know, they're not going to be at their, their peak performance if they're stressed and if they're um, dealing with an anxiety issue. So we are working to try to make sure we can mitigate those issues as much as possible. Uh, we adopted an employee assistance program, which provides a, a variety of counseling and other services for all of our employees, uh, which is something that we did to make sure that their uh, social and emotional learning needs are also being taken care of. Lastly, um, you mentioned the, um, uh, uh, the uh, internet providers and the vouchers. I'm assuming this will be, um, is, uh, are there um, specific local internet providers that have been approved to provide these services? And, 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 and how can people um, uh, fill out the applications to get the vouchers to get free internet uh, uh, in their homes if they qualify? So all families will receive a letter next week that has all of those details. And we've uh, actually sent letters that, that um, give them some information so that they can expect um, the letter that they will receive from ADECA next week. Um, it's not our program, so they, they have set all of the criteria for it. 
um, and they have already made contact with whichever internet providers will be available. And so when they get their letter, it'll be specific to the Selma Dallas County community and it'll tell them exactly which providers um, are available for them to reach out to to access the service. So, um, and it will include the voucher as well that they will have to present um, to that internet provider uh, once um, they, they receive the letter. Okay, and do you have any cases in the school system with staff or scholars uh, who have actually uh, contracted or tested um, positive for COVID-19? We've had cases, absolutely. I mean, as, you know, we're in a community, so we've had cases and we're following the CDC guidelines in terms of um, the uh, quarantine, the self-quarantine and the contact tracing as best we, we can do. Um, our nurse, our lead nurse, Nurse Austin, um, takes the lead on that if, if there's a suspected case or a case and we make sure we report it to the, um, the correct people at the Alabama Department of Public Health and then just follow their guidance from there. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, that's one thing that we're making sure that everyone is aware of is what to do if you have symptoms, what to do if you test positive, you know, because that's something that it's going to happen and we had a, um, a webinar uh, for superintendents um, a couple of weeks ago with the Alabama Dep Department of Public Health they were pushing out their toolkit to assist it with reopening schools and the first thing they said is you're going to have cases you know mm -hmm. I mean we're not we're not in a bubble um, so you know we, we and, and what I really hope is that we don't have panic when it happens because it's going to happen mm. um, you know it, it already has you know because like I said many of our families have already been impacted um, and we just need to make sure that we're following the guidelines and um, not getting comfortable um, you know with with the the fact that that maybe we haven't had a case at a specific school you know so just following those guidelines and in the event that there are our symptoms or a case um, involving our lead nurse and making sure that she um, uh, is, is addressing it and, um, and like I said, you know, leading with the way with the contact tracing so anyone who may have come in contact with someone would also be notified and be given the specific guidelines that they need in the event that they have to self-quarantine. And you've, you've seen the news as schools have reopened. You've got um, you know, some with just a few three to five cases, and then you've got others that have you know, over 100 uh, people who some are, are of, quarantined. Some have opened because and then they had to the close. Some have opened and closed and, and, and mm -hmm. went from face to face back to virtual. So, yeah, you know, at the, really the cool. K-12 level as well as the college level, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, so it, the, the virus is real and we're taking it very seriously, which is why we're opening with virtual learning. Mm -hmm. um, because if you know, we can't predict the future, but but my prediction was that if we reopened with face to face learning, it would just be a matter of time before we would close and have to go to full virtual anyway. And mm -hmm. so that, that was one of the reasons that we did make the decision to go ahead and move forward with virtual. Um, but the primary reason is just because of an, an abundance of caution um, around health and safety for all of our scholars and families and our teachers, leaders, and staff. So lastly, before you make your closing remarks, um, what is the procedure for employees, whether they're the maintenance or bus drivers or teachers and faculty and staff, what is your procedure? Do you test uh, every day for temperature when you come into the building, or how or are they are they are they even in the building? Are they teaching from home? How is that you know working? Yeah, so we are in buildings. Um, our teachers aren't aren't necessarily in the building every day. We have what we call an A B schedule. So most teachers are working in the building either Monday and Wednesday or Tuesday and Thursday. And Friday is a remote learning day for everybody, so we can deep clean our buildings. Um, but we do have thermometers for temperature checks and a protocol where those wellness questions that are asked: Have you been in contact with anyone? Uh, that has, has, has tested positive and do you have symptoms or have you had any symptoms of, of the um, coronavirus. So we um, do have the wellness screening that's taking place at our buildings when, um, you know, our teachers and staff enter and, you know, it's, we're limiting visitors. Of course, right now we have packet pickup and um, device pickup 
for um, our, our family. So of course, we've got a lot of visitors right now, but once we actually begin the school year, we will be um, limiting the number of visitors or, or the reasons that people would visit schools. Um, mm -hmm. But we absolutely do have those wellness checks in place and um, you know, the person in charge at each school, which is usually the school nurse, is um, keeping a, a, a log of the temperatures and a log of the responses to those wellness questions. Is there anything you'd like to say uh, to the community, uh, to our uh, listeners and readers and viewers, and any information, telephone numbers you'd like to give out uh, or other information for people to get in touch if they have questions? Well, I would just like to encourage everyone to continue to uh, follow our social media. We're at Selma Schools. Um, our website is selmacityschools.org, um, and there's an abundance of information there. And for parents, if you've got specific questions, please reach out to your school. Um, that's where you're going to get the best answers for everything from um, specific needs for your scholar. If you've got some scheduling questions or anything of that nature, please reach out to your child's school for, um, for your specific questions. And I just want to thank the entire Selma community for the support that they've provided um, and for the grace that they've provided. You know, we're, we're trying to figure this thing out as best we can. This is new for everybody. Um, we've said um, numerous times that we're doing something that that no one has ever done in our lifetime. We are opening schools during a pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, and so the grace that the community has shown us has been amazing. And we're gonna need you to keep doing that because we're, we're not gonna always get it right. Um, you know, this is, there are so many unknowns um, within the direction that we're headed in. And so we're gonna need your, your patience and your flexibility and your grace. And I'm thanking you in advance for that. Um, you know, so, so please don't, don't get um, upset or panic or anything of that nature. Let's sit down and let's continue to communicate and work through the, our challenges together. Um, and lastly, I just want to say we are one team, one voice, committed to excellence and everyone within this Selma Dallas County community is a part of that team and I am forever grateful for the amount of, of support and um, the lifting up that they have already done and a big shout out to our Board of Education for that same reason because they have have been tremendous advocates for the work that we're doing and for supporting the work that's happening to get us to this point in the first place. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you to our Board of Education and thank you to the Selma community and thank you Randy for having us on and for allowing us to share uh, the great things that are happening with Team Selma. Well, thank you so much and for your time. And, you know, I just think, you know, a lot of times we talk about um, not having uh, uh, the control of our narrative. One of the positive narratives, I believe, is that the Selma City School System is ahead of the curve. You know, we need to say that. We need to point that out. And with your team and what you guys are doing, thank God that you were already headed in this direction. And, and now the money, usually the money has to come first. But now you guys right. were headed again. Now the money's coming to help you complete what you already were on for us to do anyway. So I think that's a blessing. Absolutely. Thank you, you guys. Yeah, keep up the good work. Thank you. We appreciate that. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll talk the next time. I'll keep keep us in right. keep us informed on what okay. you're doing. And Courtney's doing a wonderful All right. job. Sounds by good. The way. Oh, Courtney's amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you.